Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. The Writers Guild of America officially took to the picket lines on May 2nd, and today we're going to dive into why. My guest is Lowell Peterson, Executive Director for the Writers Guild of America East, or WGAE. Lowell, welcome back to Below the Line. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here, Lowell. And I know a lot of people have questions about this. Certainly, many people are aware there's been a lot of talk about the strike and what the implications are going to be. But let's start with a little bit of background. For listeners who might not be aware of how the unions are set up, talk to us a little about the difference between WGA East and WGA West, and then how you coordinate when it comes to contracts. Yeah, well, we're geographically aligned. The writers go Guild of America East represents TV and movie writers east of the Mississippi and the Writers Guild West, west of the Mississippi. We also have a bunch of other members. We have a lot of people in the news business, for example, uh, broadcast, radio, online, etc. But uh, this contract that we, we are on strike to help negotiate uh, is a joint effort of east and west. And, of course, there's a lot of TV and movie writers in Los Angeles, more even than in New York. But we are linked arm in arm and, and sitting down at the table jointly against the uh, the Association of Employers. Hey, let's talk some more about that. So the AMPTP is the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, and they represent all of the majors. And then most companies in this business are represented as one group. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, exactly right. They're the majors. They're the TV networks and major studios, some of the movie studios. They've been joined lately by some of the tech companies that are also big content producers like Netflix. Even Amazon and Apple have literally have a seat at the table. And our our density, to use the union term, is is really great. Uh, we have, you know, essentially everything above a certain budget is Writers Guild covered. So even even the smaller studios and smaller networks that don't happen to be part of the AMPTP, they all have to sign our contract. So this really is a total industry contract. Now, talk to me about the negotiating process itself. How long was it going on? When did you first meet? Was it three years ago you last negotiated? Give us some more information about that. Yeah, every three years we sit down at the table. Often uh, there's uh, uh, there have been negotiations with other unions that give a, a sense of of what we think the AMPTP will agree to. It's even sometimes called a pattern agreement. We've never been super happy with it because writers have needs that are different from directors or actors or crew. But uh, the last time we went on strike was 15 years ago. And every three years since then, we've had these negotiations. And we, we on the union side prepare for a very long time. We do surveys of our members. We have lots of meetings. We do research. We figure out what, what people are experiencing on the job what the industry can can tolerate in terms of economics and and what proposals would actually address the problems that our members bring to our attention and that was very important this year because they brought a lot of issues to our attention so we put together a bunch of ideas we have the members vote on that we put together a big negotiating committee of working writers and then we sit down in a in a conference room literally in sherman oaks california part of la and the company representatives are on the other side of the table, and we're on this side of the table. The negotiations are somewhat formal, formalistic even, you know, uh, scripted performances. But I'll tell you, the, the, the discussion in our committee room is not. Uh, people people talk about, hey, I think that's a great idea. Hey, I think that idea stinks. And uh, the process, that sort of democratic process helps us come to conclusions on, on what proposals to push for and what ones to compromise on. We were at the table for six full weeks we made some progress in some issues. I'll, I'll be fair to the AMPTP. Uh, a couple things uh, they moved in our direction on. Uh, a few things they moved in our direction on, but only if we agreed to some pretty lousy stuff they insisted on. But really, in our core issues, they didn't want to talk to us at all. Well, let's spend some more time on that. What are the core issues on the table this time? You know, fundamentally, and this is going to sound kind of broad, but it's true. We're talking about the long term ability of writers to have middle-class careers. Our big negotiation, our big contract is called the minimum basic agreement. It's been negotiated over the course of decades. I like to joke around that it was, you know, we are living in the digital age, right? Everything is digital. Streaming video on demand is, is digital technology 
implemented in the entertainment industry. And it has completely transformed the way content is commissioned by the company, produced, distributed, owned, and of course, important for our purposes, paid. So digital technology rules the day and our contract was mostly negotiated in the analog era, you know, the era of gun smoke and homicide and, and movies that you actually went to a movie theater to watch instead of watching them at home on your big screen TV. So there was a, a, an awful lot of change that really has not helped writers. Uh, we've done surveys in the TV side, which includes these streamers. You know, I, I, I use the term TV to cover that whole ground, even though more and more of the stuff is actually stuff you watch on, on the streaming platforms. Uh, the pay on that side of the house went down 24% relative to inflation over uh, approximately a decade. You know, feature writers, movie writers, they are facing increasing pressures to just keep writing and keep working without getting paid more money. We have people in the comedy variety world, like late night shows like The Fallon, John Oliver, Seth Meyers, et cetera shows. Those are all TV shows. And, and you know, those terms are pretty good. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you've got a job on that, you're doing okay. Uh, to do better, we're negotiating to get it better. But if you're writing one of those shows and it's for a streaming network, there are no terms in our minimum basic agreement. You could get paid whatever the company has in mind. And your residuals, which is the re payments you get when your show stays up online or gets reused or sold in other markets, those are really terrible. So, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. If, if you're a, if you're a TV writer, say, the the amount of weeks that you work in a given year has a lot to do with how much money you make. This is you're you're hired to write a show. It used to be a show was like Gunsmoke or Homicide or you know Law and Order. You'd work for most of the year. You'd have a, a month or two off. You know, go on vacation. You go back in the room. You could you could earn your health benefits. You could you could do okay on your pension. You could pay your mortgage or your rent. Increasingly, as streaming has come into play, there are far fewer episodes for a season. So you work fewer weeks, therefore make less money. The companies have figured out a way to get more work out of fewer writers. So they have these mini rooms where there are fewer writers employed for fewer weeks. And because of this, you have many fewer opportunities to build a career. So it used to be that you would move up the chain. You would write on a show for a full season. And the next season, you'd go up the a grade in the pay scale and you get more responsibilities, learn how to do some producing. All, all of those career advancement opportunities and opportunities to work a lot of the year, if not the whole year, all of that is going away. So we've got proposals on the table to address all those things, plus residuals, plus the comedy variety issues I've talked about. And we, by the way, we also have a big proposal on artificial intelligence, which I don't know about you, but last year, this time, I didn't even know what it was. I, but now suddenly it's uh, it's it's in the news and, and we've got proposals to say, look, artificial intelligence is great, but Scripts have to be written by writers, human writers, and most importantly, script fees have to be paid to human writers. So we have all these things. And what happened at the end of the negotiations? May 1st was our last day before our contract expired. The company said to us straight up on these issues about having enough writers in a writer's room, having writers work long enough, having writers work deep enough into the production to be able to advance their careers. AI, you know, you got to drop your proposals or we're not going to talk about anything else. So. We're out on the streets. We had no choice. Uh, our members had already voted 98% in favor of a strike if we couldn't make progress. And now they're out in the street. There's a whole lot of them out in the street. You know, and because the challenges you're talking about, people don't maybe realize. But again, back to those days when it was 22 episodes in a season. Yes, as you said, it was like a career and you would be there and it would be most of a year. But now it's not like you can just line those things up because they don't build the same, well, the way it sounds anymore year to year. Yeah, no, that's a big challenge. I mean, the sort of gold standard was eventually become a showrunner or, or a co-EP. And in order to develop those skills, you have to be around long enough and go on set or have those responsibilities enough so that you learn how to do it. So you didn't just screw it up, you know, and, right. and with these short seasons and small rooms, people don't have that opportunity. And the seasons, as you know, shift around too. I mean, there's it's not like the, the fall TV season that used to correspond to the introduction of new new car models you know it's, a show can start and end at any time so you you don't really have predictability for your career too and listen it sounds like what we're proposing is super expensive right i mean we want more money we want more jobs if the companies agree to everything we put on the table and you know certainly we would like that but we wouldn't 
got the farm on it, right? If they agreed to everything, it would be less than 2% of their profits. It's an extraordinarily profitable industry. You know, I mean, look, the stock prices go up and down like in any industry. They've invested billions of dollars buying new content, buying each other up. You know, the mergers have been kind of head scratchers. But in the main, if you look at it from a three or a 10 year perspective, this is an extraordinarily profitable industry. And, and what we proposed is a fraction, two percent, less than two percent of their profits. And if you look at their revenues, it's like a tenth of a percent for the big companies. So it's not like what we've got on the table is going to break the bank. It isn't. The thing is, in order to and I'm on my soapbox, so forgive me for one one <laughs> one more speech. You know, if you don't have writers who can sustain careers and move up the ladder how are you going to keep the content machine rolling i mean everybody who works on a film or a, or a series is critical right the grip the camera the editors the scenic artists the hair and makeup everybody actors of course even i would even grant you that producers are very important <laughs> but you know <laughs> maybe you, not every single one of them now maybe maybe not all the credited producers. But. <laughs> yeah <laughs> But, uh, you know, if you don't have people who, who can earn a living doing this and develop those skills, where are you going to get your shows from? You know, you need to have skilled people in all these jobs. And if you it's true in any one of these cl job classifications, if, if you can't make a living on it, you're going to go do something else. And therefore, the skilled workforce will disappear. And this is what our members are telling us. Look, I'm, I don't know if we don't correct these problems. I don't think I can sustain a career writing for TV and movies anymore. And that doesn't help the industry. That doesn't help the other crafts. It doesn't help the other unions. I think that what, that our fight is meaningful for everybody who works for these companies. Well, well, tell me more about what you're hearing from the other unions at the official level or on the street level, as far as their members and their representation, they're not in the same negotiations. Their negotiations are staggered. But as far as the actions that WGA is taking, where do the other unions stand? Uh, I have to tell you, the solidarity has been great and amazing. And at both the leadership level and the rank and file level, I've been in touch with the leaders of all the other unions. They're all with us. They've all issued statements of solidarity. They've all more than that, talked to their own members about the importance of the Writers Guild strike and pointed out where their contracts and the law permit it, obviously. Uh, look, in these cases, you can honor the, the picket line. And in fact, we are seeing a lot of people, crew and drivers, honoring our picket lines. We've seen lots of people, including those who might be precluded by their contracts from honoring our picket lines. They're showing up on our picket lines when they can. We've had hundreds of SAG members, hundreds of IATSE members, you know, drivers, actors equity members, members of uh, all of the unions in the entertainment industry, and frankly, even outside the entertainment industry, just sending members in droves to our picket lines and our rallies, sending speakers to our to our rallies. It's just been uh, inspiring. I, you know, as, as a union leader, I, I like to think this is the way the movement should work, right? We should all talk to each other, pay attention to each other's concerns, support each other when we need to. And that's happening. At the rank and file level, if a crew member honors our pick line, that could be a day's pay. It could be a job. So those are people who are really stalwart in doing that. Now, not everybody's going to honor every pick line on every production, but we have shut down a lot of productions. We've disrupted a lot of productions. And that's solely because of the solidarity that rank and file members have have shown. I think part of it is because they know, hey, this struggle is actually affecting me. These weird seasons, this new digital technology, this AI stuff, the decline in residuals, all of this affects me too. But I think there's just a, a, a human solidarity element that I can tell you, my members tell me, wow, it is so inspiring to see people with IATSE shirts on or, or SAG after shirts or, you know, Teamsters. And it's just, uh, people love it. The, the energy is strong. And I think it's going to help us win. Specifically from the front lines of the strike. Are you telling me then that some shows said, okay, we don't have writers, but we're still going to try to film, but then not enough people actually came into work of these other departments or they had needs for writers. Like again, how does it work to shut down a show? Talk to me more about how having a picket line keeps the pressure on the producers. In terms of actual productions, that sound stages or location shoots, you know, we have crews drivers just say i'm not i'm not crossing that picket line 
and they'll lose a day of production or they'll lose a few hours of production or they'll have to reschedule appearing, you know, call sheets to try to outsmart us in terms of when our pickets show up. Cause we we're pretty nimble. You know, we, <laughs> we've sent people 150 miles uh, in the dead of night to, to put a picket line up. So we, the direct pressure is the companies are losing money because they're losing production or sometimes a whole day, sometimes longer than a day, sometimes a few hours in terms of overall consciousness. Uh, for example, we've, we've had big rallies and pickets up at the upfronts. And what we're doing is telling the industry, look, the writers are serious. The writers have allies in the industry and outside the industry. This is going to really affect the long-term health of your company. Advertisers need to think twice about whether they're going to invest a lot of money in shows that might simply not be made. They certainly won't be written. And eventually, pretty soon, they're going to run out of scripts. So even though, even, even if they were able to produce everything that they currently have scripts for, and they're not because of our pickets. They're going to run out of scripts and then they can't produce anything. So if I were a rational business person on the other side of the table, I'd say, oh boy, this is a real strike. It's going to be effective. I better rethink my position and come back to the bargaining table. And they will. Just a question of when. Now, and you mentioned 2007, 2008 was the last strike. How is this one similar or different than strikes in the past? To be candid, that we've got more solidarity and more support than we did. I mean, I think the issues that were underlying the strike in 2007, 2008, it turns out they've resonated because it was a, it was about streaming. It was about online. It was about what was then called new media. You know, it's not new anymore. But I think partly because of careful preparation, partly because we've spent a lot of time just building relationships with our sibling unions, partly because of the issues maybe partly because of the general sort of pro-labor environment we're working in now, I think we've got a lot more solidarity. I think we're, we've got a lot more people out on the lines. We've got a lot more support from other unions. I suspect that the ANTTP didn't anticipate this much power this early in the strike. You know, we, listen, we've got 100% compliance. The fundamental thing we're doing here is writers are not writing, and that's where our power is. But the support we're getting from the other unions, I think, is unprecedented and very powerful. It's only been a couple of weeks. Is it premature to guess how this is going to play out? Or what are you guys expecting for the process going forward? Well, we're prepared to stay out as long as it takes. I mean, literally, logistically and financially, we are prepared to stay out as long as it takes. In terms of what we expect, you know, it's hard to say. The DGA, the Directors Guild, is currently at the table with the AMPTP. I think the AMPTP has the bandwidth to talk to us at the same time, but they're not. So we'll see what, what happens with the DGA. Next up, a couple weeks after that, is SAG-AFTRA. Now, I know they've already talked about doing a strike authorization vote. So I, I don't know that the AMPTP is going to have an easy time with SAG-AFTRA. I think SAG-AFTRA members are fired up and the leadership is ready for hard negotiations. But I would say that the timing of those two negotiations probably in the real world is going to affect the timing of ours. Because as much as I like to think that settling our strike could inspire the AMPTP to burn some midnight oil and come sit down with us. They may not do that until they're done with those two unions. So we're talking there for a couple of months, but it may well be that they pivot and they say, you know what, we got, we're getting hurt here. We need to get the writers guild strike done. I mean, I, I do think they need to think hard about their approach to these negotiations. I think they probably meant it when they said they're not interested in talking with us about some of our core proposals to save writing careers because those are hard proposals they're not expensive but they require something other than just okay we'll, we'll add a few pennies to your pay envelope that's not the kind of negotiation we're in it's more complicated requires more more changes I, i'm not saying it's going to be easy for them but they're going to need to do it and they're going to need to do it with some speed otherwise they're going to have a long strike on their hands so we've talked about union solidarity folks who are not members of the union but interested in showing their support what can those listeners do well we've got lots of room on our picket lines uh so people can go to our, our web page this is joint east west this will apply to people in la as well as new york or chicago we had a big picket line in chicago boston philadelphia so wga contract 2023.org you can go on there click on it you'll find out where where is a picket in your neighborhood and you could sign up for it and that would be great we are um, encouraging people to donate money to the Entertainment Community Fund, formerly known as the Actors Fund. Uh, you click on the TV and, and film professionals 
button on that and that money will go into a fund so that if there are people who are hurting crew writers uh you name it because of the strike uh, or because of the changes in the industry they can get emergency help from from the entertainment community fund so those those are two things and just generally you know there's a lot of social media out there tweet your support uh we are also getting support from members of congress and local legislatures so if people have good relationships with their their reps, say, hey, I support the Writers Guild strike. What are you doing to help out? Read off the website one more time in case people missed it so that they know where they can go. Sure. It's WGA Contract 2023.org. And by the way, it has lots of information about the issues in the strike and, and all kinds of stuff. And it's got some fun videos. So in addition to learning about where to pick it, you can learn something about the strike and, and even even be entertained. Well, this is really important stuff, and I appreciate you being here. On that note, we are going to call it a wrap, but thank you again. That was really important. Many thanks for having me on. I'm always glad to talk about it, and, and we're, we're going to keep it going as long as it takes. Good luck, Will. Good luck. Listeners, I always appreciate your feedback. You'll find my contact info at our website, belowtheline1word.biz. That's B-I-Z. You'll also find past episodes and links to all of our social media, so check it out. My closing credits, thanks to Curtis Five for our music, John Juan for our logo, and all of our listeners, I appreciate you. Please rate us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends. Thanks again from Below the Line.